Welcome back. Let's continue along with roundworms. Uh, let's talk about the next parasite now, hookworm. Hookworm is a very important uh, parasite throughout the world because it's one of the major causes of iron deficiency anemia. Because the worm basically hooks on to your intestines and sucks out the blood, uh, causing you to lose a lot of blood in the process. There are two main species that affect humans, Nicada americanus and Acyclostoma or Ancyclostoma duodenale. What's the life cycle of the parasite? Very similar to what we talked about in Ascaris. Uh, you can be infected um, not by GI or by contaminated food and drink in this case, but through the skin. But it's similar to Ascaris in, the, in, the, in, in terms of love in the lungs. So what happens is that you're walking around barefoot in an in area where hookworm is endemic. The larvae burrows through the, the feet, and you can get a rash or a, allergic type reaction where the worm burrs or the larvae burrows through those, your soles of the feet. And again, like Ascaris, uh, there's something about these parasites that um, where they really love the lungs. They go to the lungs. They affect the alveolar first. Uh, they move from the alveolar to the bronchial tree. From the bronchial tree, they migrate up to the trachea. You swallow it. The, the larvae mature into adult worms, and the adult worms lay the eggs. And then the cycle continues uh, from the soil, etc. But the problem is um, when you're laying the when the larvae are in the GI system and they mature into adults, the adults hook on to the small intestines and they suck out all this blood. And, and as I said, it's the most common cause of iron deficiency anemia in the world because of these teeth that the hookworm or plates that the hookworm have. As the hook will migrate through the lungs, like in Ascaris, it can also cause pulmonary symptoms as well. So you can diagnose it by iron deficiency anemia as a clue, but mainly over and parasitic analysis in the stool is how we uh, diagnose most of these infections. So my pearl in the section is that one of the most common causes of iron deficiency anemia in the world is due to hookworm infection. And here is, uh, you can see the nice hookworm with uh, all these pointy little teeth here waiting to suck uh, the blood from your small intestines. Let's move on to another case now, a related case. This is a case of dog hookworm, not the human hookworm that we talked about. This is a 23-year-old returning traveler with pain on the right foot returning from Thailand. Uh, you can see like there's a, suddenly a worm-like object uh, sort of moving around in the on her feet, and these are the, the lateral aspect of her feet by her fifth toe, and, and here it is here. So this is what we call uh, visceral larva migrants. Uh, visceral because it's on the viscera and not on the entrails, on the insides really. Larva because uh, larva is the life stage at which we're talking about in terms of this parasite, and migrants because it's migrating. So this is dog hookworm causing visceral larva migrants. It's not human hookworm, so not Nicada or uh, any of the other species we talked about. And this is the hookworm that dogs get. So a lot of vets are exposed to this particular infection. People, you know, I had a patient once who went to Jamaica and she was uh, volunteering uh, in a dog pound. And when she came back, she had uh, what looked like a worm moving around in her sole of her feet but actually it was not human hookworm, it was dog hookworm causing visceral larva migrants. So what happens is that you walk around, um, the dogs, the adult worms in the dog have, you know, the adult dog hookworm worms have laid eggs. They infect the soil, you walk around the soil or contaminate feces, et cetera. And, and the dog hookworm gets into you. It's trying to find the dog lungs, but there are no dog lungs in you. So it's kind of moving around the body trying to find it, um, but ultimately it fails. And because it can't complete its life cycle, uh, it dies. But you can see from the pictures that, uh, you know, as it moves around, it can cause this kind of intense uh, reaction that can be quite itchy and inflammatory. But if you don't do anything, uh, uh, they eventually die, uh, and uh, you don't even need antiparasitics for the most part, although many people feel nervous and they end up taking some sort of antiparasitics. Let's move on to the next case now. This is another parasite, and a typical patient is a 55-year-old renal transplant patient 
presenting with fever, cough, and abdominal pain. On blood cultures, uh, the patient looks like uh, he or she is septic, uh, and you get two organisms in the blood culture. Both of these organisms come from the gut. These are E. coli and enterococcus. And what the picture shows is this weird rash on the, the abdomen of the patient. Um, it kind of looks um, very like th there's a lot of, um, you know, inflammatory uh, reaction. Uh, they're very, very uh, almost petechial uh, in, in appearance. So this is strongyloides. How do you get strongyloides? Uh, well, like hookworm, it, it comes in through the skin. So you walk around contaminated soil, the strongyloides gets in, and like hookworm and like ascaris, it loves the lung. So the first place it kind of goes to is the lung, goes to the bronchial, uh, it goes to the alveolar area, then it goes up the bronchial tree, goes up the trachea, you swallow it. Uh, then the larvae mature into adult worms, the worms lay eggs. And this is where strongyloides is a little bit different. So strongyloides is the only parasite where it can actually complete its entire life cycle uh, in the human. And it could be a long time between when you get exposed to strongyloides and when you get disease. So what happens is that as the adult worms mature in the GI tract, uh, making lots of eggs, these eggs can hatch into these larvae, and the larvae can actually borrow straight from the mucosa back to the lungs, but it can also, if you are immunosuppressed, uh, migrate to all parts of the body, including the brain, the skin, and as the eggs come out through the, and uh, as the eggs hatch into larvae, and they come out through the anal area, they can also go through the anal area into your body again, back to the lungs and to all the parts of the body. So an immunocompromised host, uh, it can be quite severe with very disseminated disease. And if people become immunocompromised after not being immunocompromised initially, say like Vietnam vets who in Southeast Asia uh, many decades ago who were exposed to strongyloides, and now they're immunocompromised maybe because they've gotten a transplant or maybe because they have uh, COPD and they're on a lot of steroids, the strongyloides can come back, and it come back, comes back in terms of being uh, uh, having a high rate of replication. And this uh, auto-infection can occur very, very frequently, and hyperinfection, which means a lot more parasites can also occur, affecting many organs, including the lungs, of course, the GI tract, the skin, uh, the brain, and other organs as well. So, but most people don't even know they have strongyloides. It, it causes very mild symptoms, if any. And only when you're immunocompromised, if you have severe AIDS or HIV disease, if you are uh, iatrogenically immunocompromised because you're a transplant patient who've received uh, immunosuppression meds, if you have uh, certain types of malignancies like HDLV, those are people who are going to get this strongyloides like crazy, which we call hyperinfection syndrome, because you can auto-infect yourself uh, in that way. How do you diagnose it? Well, you can diagnose it by stool ONP, like many of these parasites. But when somebody has hyperinfection syndrome or an, as a result of auto-infection, uh, you can get strongyloides all over the place. So you can get it on the BAL sample, you can get it on the urine, you can get it in the GI tract, and you can see these worms, which make kind of like this S shape, S for, for strongyloides as well. But many times we diagnose it through serology, which is pretty sensitive um, in most cases to diagnose this infection if you haven't reached the stage where you're making lots and lots of parasites that, going, the, that are moving all over the body. You treat with ivermectin, uh, and, and that's probably one of the, the main parasites that we, we see here pretty often because of our large immunocompromised population where people might have been exposed some time ago you know, wherever, if they were born in another part of the world, for example. So the skin rash that strongyloides causes is called larva currents. So larva currents is Latin for racing larva or running larva. So remember, we talked about another kind of uh, word with larva in it, cutaneous larva migrans, which was associated with dog hookworm. This kind of rash is called uh, larva currents just because they move a little bit faster than the uh, cutaneous larva migrans of dog hookworms. So when you see these 
strongyloides in the skin, uh, they're generally in people who are immunocompromised and they have lots and lots of strongyloides. So if you biopsy this rash, you'd see the worm inside the biopsy. So let's review the transmission. So you walk around, you get strongyloides worm or larva from the soil. Uh, that goes to the lung, just like Ascaris and hookworm. These uh, three organisms love the lung. Uh, and then from the lungs, uh, you, it migrates up to the trachea. You swallow the, the larvae. And in the gut, uh, they migrate into adult worms and they lay more eggs. So what happens in strongyloides? Again, it's the only parasite, or one of the few parasites, where you can auto-infect yourself and you don't need some other host or the parasite doesn't need to leave the body uh, to then complete its life cycle. It, it can complete its life cycle inside of you. So from the gut, uh, as the larvae exits the body, uh, you can have larvae burrowing back into the uh, perianal area and then going back to the lungs, uh, and then you swallow it again. So that's how auto-infection happens. But then what can happen in terms of immunosuppression is that from the lungs, as the larvae move to the gut, they can move to all parts of the body, and that's really what's called hyperinfection syndrome. So we can get hyperinfection syndrome because we can auto-infect ourselves. And when you're immunosuppressed, you can get tons and tons of parasites occurring. And as these parasites occur, they can actually poke holes in, in the gut as they're trying to migrate, and the gut bacteria can then go into the bloodstream, causing these super infection with bacteria because the bacteria come from the gut. So just to just review the case that we presented, uh, in this immunocompromised patient, the patient presented with bacterial sepsis because the worms were burrowing through the gut and making little holes where gut bacteria can then go into the bloodstream. So what the patient presented with wasn't a, a worm issue, it seemed like it was a bacterial issue, but it was because the worm caused the problem in the first place. So what are my pearls for this section? Well, first of all, you can diagnose strongyloides by serology or by finding the larvae and not the eggs in the stool. Um, remember in pinworm, we looked for eggs, but in strongyloides, we look for larvae because larvae are where all the action occurs. Strongyloides can complete life cycle in humans as opposed to many of the other parasites. And you can get sepsis from enteric bacteria as the larvae penetrate the gut, poking holes in the gut, and having the bacteria that live in the gut normally move from the gut into the bloodstream. So let's move on to the next case, uh, the next parasite in this section. Uh, this patient is a 45-year-old male presenting with high fever, muscle pain throughout. White count is 12 uh, with 55% eosinophils, very significant. Anything above 20% is particularly significant uh, in terms of eosinophilia. This guy turns out to be a, a boar hunter. So this parasite is trichinella. Uh, it's a roundworm. Uh, how do you get it? Well, you ingest it typically in its larval insisted uh, stage. So these larvae like to wall themselves off into cysts, and these cysts occur in striated muscle. So people who are affected are people who are hunters, particularly in hunters of wild pigs, for example, or bears or cougars. And, and if the meat is undercooked, you can ingest uh, intact uh, larvae, essentially, in the cyst form in the meat. Uh, what happens is that the uh, larvae then move to the gut. They mature into adult worms. Uh, they lay the eggs. The eggs hatch. They turn into larvae. And then the larvae migrate into muscle, where it's its preferred home. And again, it walls off itself into the cyst form. And this process really is what causes the disease. And um, so here's another patient who's a bear hunter in this case. And in week one, uh, you can get mainly nausea or abdominal pain as they are mainly in the GI system. And as the larvae migrate out of the GI system to the muscles, striated muscles, and to uh, other areas, and in that process of migration, you can get some other symptoms. So pain of the muscles or myositis, or periorbital edema, particularly prominent symptoms that you can find with trichinella. How do you diagnose this? Well, you can diagnose it by seeing an increase in CPKs because of that muscle inflammation, as well as, well as eosinophilia, like in this case with this percentage of eosinophils above 20%. You can also diagnose it by serology, 
and it's oftentimes uh, diagnosed by biopsy as well. And if you biopsy the muscle, you can find uh, the roundworm in this larval stage insisting itself in the, in, in the muscle as well. So that's the way it's frequently diagnosed. This is periorbital edema, uh, very, very co uh, notable, not common, but notable for in trichinosis, uh, um, again, because of this inflammatory response as the larvae are migrating to muscle. Let's move on to another parasite. Uh, this is a, uh, a typical case or atypical case of, of the kinds of cases we might see. You're working in Haiti and a 39-year-old woman presents to your clinic with six months of progressive lower extremity uh, swelling. So you can see uh, this particular kind of swelling, all mainly its lower extremities here. It's very prominent. We call it elephantiasis as well. Uh, this is filariasis. So filariasis is caused by a roundworm called Wuchicheria bancrofti. And what happens is that the mosquito, in this case, spreads the parasite. Uh, it goes straight to the lymph nodes, and it may take up to a year or so to develop in the lymph nodes to adults. What happens is the adults uh, uh, mate and they uh, release the parasites in its microfiliary stage. This gets into the bloodstream, so you can diagnose the infection by the microfiliary in the bloodstream. And it's particularly common in parts of Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean, like Haiti is in this case, the Pacific Islands, where I spent some time, for example, there are lots of WHO campaigns to eliminate filariasis by eliminating mosquitoes as well as trying to find people uh, and diagnose them by microfilaria and giving them antiparasitics. So again, one of these CDC maps showing you the life cycle, but essentially, as in contrast to many of the other parasites we talked about, uh, you have uh, the mosquito uh, basically being infected and then infecting the human. Uh, these microfilaria go to the lymph nodes, they hang out there, the adults hang out in the lymph nodes, and it's because of this lymph node uh, granuloma formation, inflammation that happens. That's really why the disease causes, because the lymph nodes get blocked and because the lymph can't get back up to where it's supposed to be and the circulation gets compromised. You get a lot of fluid really backed up like a traffic jam. So you can get uh, scrotal edema, uh, leg edema, and that's really what causes many of its symptoms of filariasis. So again, like I said, uh, clinically you can see lymphedema, particularly in the legs and scrotum. You diagnose it when you see the microfilaria stage in the bloodstream. You can get a blood uh, a, a thin smear actually to find these microfilaria, or you can ultrasound the lymphatics to find the adult forms as well. So to summarize uh, these parasites, we've talked about a lot of roundworms in this section. Uh, this slide is really meant to be a review. You can see that many of them love the lungs. Uh, you can review uh, hookworms, strongyloides, uh, in this case, and ascaris, um, and then some of the other parasites as well. Thank you very much for your attention.